Hello. Hi there. Good afternoon. Good evening to you. Good evening to you and good afternoon also to everyone. Yeah, hey everybody. Yeah, you're right on time. Yay. I'm usually late, so this is this is good. This is an excellent start for us. <laughs> Definitely. Just looking through the list. Hello, everybody. Come and say hello in the chat. Yeah. Uh, okay. It's okay if I let people in from the waiting room, right? Yeah, sure, sure. Lorena is uh, in, the waiting, in the waiting room all the time. So uh, yeah, I, it's some sort of bug or I, I don't know. It's just like, I can't just uh, meet her. Do you know who it is? No. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah. I try to like uh, send in chat uh in in the waiting room that yes. she restart restarts her zoom but still not in oh no hopefully it fixes itself it's very soon yeah <laughs> so for those of you who are here already let us know where you are joining from i presume you're all croatian but maybe not no, I think there's uh, people from all over. So mostly uh, Croatia or this part of uh, or this region region here. But uh, I saw on on um, attendees list uh, people from outside of Croatia, and uh, we'll see. Will they join us? We will see indeed. Yes. I'm just going to send the link out on Twitter as well. That's yeah. okay. Hi to Jackie from, from Houston. Yay. Yeah, great. Okay. Yeah, we... Okay, Lorena is still there <laughs> waiting. Okay, great. Yeah, the other Lorena. <laughs> we have other Lorena. Unless you have two accounts. Fantastic. <laughs> she made it. Yeah. Okay. Pierre is arriving. How many events have you run so far? So this is number three for now. And uh, before that, we run uh, parallel also. Uh, uh, designers initiative in Osijek. So uh, we had like a uh, few months without anything, of course, like everyone. Uh, so we switched lately to, to vir virtual events. And uh, yeah, so this is where we are at the moment. But from the 1st of June, uh, things should start to, to open. And uh, so for now only, uh, outside uh, uh, places uh, or coffee shops or, or uh, restaurants with terrace, they can only have people. So we're trying also to figure out how to yeah. uh, create some events there. Yeah, things will change very fast. Yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to when I can visit European countries with Figma and come and actually say hello in person. Yeah. It'd be great to come and do this live. Definitely. As I mentioned, you of course, you know, uh, you, you you have here a place, you know, for for. I will take advantage of that. If you offer me that, I will come and I will stay for a week and I'll drink all of your wine. <laughs> we'll be glad. You, you can drink uh, uh, as much as we have, you know, <laughs> <laughs> on the house, all yeah. inclusive. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. It's all a right. great region, region here for for. Uh, wine lovers also yeah yeah I, I was in montenegro um 18 months ago and had a it's close enough uh, had a really good time there yeah 
know, from uh, people who uh, attend uh, some events, you know, who are from outside of Croatia and outside of Europe. Uh, so uh, most of the time, you know, we're like, we're not in that part of Croatia that everyone knows with sea, you know, with uh, uh, all the uh, hotels. You're a hidden beauty. Yeah, yeah, we have this like uh, rural, really beautiful um, experience here. And, you know, when we say like it's 300, 500 uh, kilometers from the sea, they say like, well, that's that's like normal, you know, it's not, it's not so, so much, you know, because we are a small country and, you know, we think that 500 kilometers is a lot, you know, but yeah. somewhere from US, it's really. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I used to live in Australia for a little bit and it was very common to drive for five hours to yeah. go somewhere. Yeah. And thinking about that in the UK, you can almost travel the entire country <laughs> in that time, yeah. <laughs> which gives you a bit of perspective. Yeah, definitely. About what's possible. Yeah, that's that's right. You know, here we when we have to go like to the main city, to capital, uh, Zagreb, you know, we're like, oh, it's three hours, two and a half. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, it seems like uh, forever, you know, <laughs> but actually it's normal for someone to go uh, I don't know, daily for somewhere uh, uh, which is taking for two hours. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I'm just going to... I'm going to drop a link into the chat and let's all go and hang out in a fig jam file for a little bit, just so I can get to know everybody who's here. I hope everybody's logged in to Figma, firstly. <laughs> I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay. I might share mine actually. And let's put a little music on. Oh, does this go on YouTube or anything? Uh, not, we're not streaming live to YouTube. Okay. Just but it will eventually it will go to, <laughs> to YouTube. Okay, so when the copyright police come for you for the music, don't blame <laughs> me. <laughs> we'll cut it out, you know, just yeah. silence. For those of you that don't know how to use FigJam yet, if you press E on your keyboard, it will pop up with a little wheel and you can add your stamp by pressing your face in here. Hmm. Okay. So those are some sort of like reactions to... Yeah, so if you press E, you get reactions as a sort of spray or you can add stamps. Mm -hmm. So this one allows me to physically stamp that down. If I hold it longer, it gets bigger on there as well. Mm -hmm. So it's an interactive, uh, like based on the amount of time you're holding. Exactly. There's, there's three stages. So it's, it doesn't get <laughs> ginormous, but it, uh, it can get bigger. Yeah, so if everyone just stamped their faces in this little square over here, then we can take some screenshots out of there afterwards and share that around. Stamp, stamp. What did you say stamp is? Press E on your keyboard. Okay. I hope it works on the, your keyboard's layout. <laughs> <laughs> no, I cannot see stamp, but... Alternatively, we have uh, everything at the bottom as well. So you see the stamp icon at the bottom of the of the window. And it takes your avatar from your account. For those of you that are brand new, I am going to pop the link back into the chat. And we're all hanging out inside this big jam file. I've just seen my friend Elliot turn up. Hello, Elliot. He's not a designer. This is probably quite alien to him. Yeah, looks good. <laughs> Thank you. So what is Elliot? Uh, he works in tax. <laughs> <laughs> the, the cleanest of professions. Oh, great. So hello, Elliot. Yes. And we're only seeing four faces in here at the moment. Everybody can come and stamp your face in the little rectangle, little square. So for those who, who uh, 
uh, like me, uh, you you had to click edit file uh, on top part. Oh, it should have been automatic. That's strange. Yeah. Maybe because so, you're in an organization. Maybe. Yeah. And at the same at the same time, if you could stamp on this line at the bottom, what you think your Figma expertise level is, whether you are entry designer on Figma or if you think you're a superstar, and if you could teach me something, then you can put your face at the end here. Mihail, I presume you would be at the end here on the superstar level. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Others can be judge of that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so which uh, stamp can we use? You can you can use anything. It might be worth doing your face, if so, so we can know who they are. But you can use whatever you want, maybe a thumb or a star or something. Yeah, uh, yeah I can I can place like uh, thumbs down on the end, you know, like superstar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't want superstars over here. Okay. I don't know. Don't say if you hold if you hold down longer when you're stamping, the the little sticker gets larger, so you can see. It. I think this is Esteban mm -hmm. over here. He's, a, he's got a larger stamp. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <clears throat> and then once you've done that, head over to these two over here. Let me know what your favorite Figma feature is and also what one feature you would like us to build. If you press S on your keyboard or go down to the bottom menu, there is a sticky note that you can add in there. Or you could just use regular text if you wanted to. I'm intrigued to know what people are going to say. I should probably add a option in here. What feature don't you like? <laughs> and then ask why. <laughs> okay, we have some beginners in the room. That's great. I'm just going to move the little stickies around a little bit so there's a bit more room. Oh, we have a couple of auto layouts in there. I'm going to remove mine. And also, if anyone just interrupt me at any time and ask something, if you want me to elaborate on something else, feel free to open your mic up and and ask. Yeah, as Louis said, you know, so this is interactive chat. And uh, so feel free, you know, to unmute yourself and comment. Of course, not everyone at the same time, but you know, <laughs> you, can do you can do that if you want. Yeah, if you want, if you want some sort of like a, a chaos, or if you want to cover up this uh, uh, rights for YouTube, then you can unmute <laughs> together. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so I just saw that this is favorite Figma feature, so I will really uh, just yes, indeed. remove one, one single answer, please. Just one. So I've seen Anto up here has said they're a beginner, which means that everything is possibly a good feature. And I'd love to know, Anto, if you let us know in the chat where where you are in your career. Are you a junior designer or you're an engineer or are you something else? And we can, we can help you out as well with some resources. Oh, great. Good. So we do actually have an education designer advocate as well. So uh, Anto, if you go and search Miggy on Twitter, he'll pop up and you can go and chat to him. He can teach you everything you need to know. He also runs sessions with uh, universities and colleges. So we've got you covered there. I'm just going to paste that link again. Zoom needs to have it so that you can see previous chats if you join after. A razor tool, that's a good one. Jackie, it would be great if you could elaborate on what you mean by more dynamic interactions.
We're waiting for Jackie. Yeah, or if anybody else has any points they want to add, and then we can jump in and I can show you branching and have a look through that. Um, unless there's anything else anybody wants to have a look at first, I appreciate that jumping straight into branching might be very confusing for people who haven't seen it before. So I'm wondering if there's an easier avenue for people to jump in. I'm looking at the experience levels down here and people are typically in the middle, so. There's one feature you would like. Yes, indeed. One, one single feature. Oh, just. <laughs> and we will ship it today. That's, that's not a promise. Variable fonts, great. Yeah, but something that's real. Video interaction. Mm. Is the music okay? The sound? Yeah. Okay. So to Esteban, who wrote the Razor tool in Photoshop, uh, there is a plugin for that uh, by was the name of the, the, the company I just order of the plug and I'll find it is it called a razor yeah and you you just connect API your API so oh. it's once you create an account and uh, you no can't find it we can send it up over afterwards <laughs> if you can find it all right should we jump into figma and have a look at some stuff So, remove BG, it's called. Oh, okay. This one. Yeah, it's from remove.bg. Oh, yeah, really... That's really smart, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, uh, I think we have enough answers in here. If anybody has anything specific they'd like me to cover, write in the chat now and we can just, just go and cover it and jump in there. I know that Mihaila has prepared some questions, so we have, do have a fallback about what we can talk about. If you want anything specific, let's jump in and have a look. Yeah. Now, like, now is the time for you to... to... Now is the time. It might be worth you just asking some of those questions that you did prepare whilst people are right thinking of theirs too. Yeah, so since uh, we were talking or you were showing us the, the Fig Jam, so what's the thought process actually behind the Fig Jam from design and of course business perspective, you know, uh, which market uh, did you plan, did you have in plan to cover and uh, what was the overall idea behind it? Yeah, of course. So. I'm probably you're probably all aware that the whiteboarding market is quite saturated and there are lots of tools and you don't need me to tell you what they are and we have businesses across the globe trying to solve this problem of design light effectively and what I mean by that is Figma is fantastic for designers and the people who are comfortable with design tools what we ultimately want to be able to do is give people who might not be designers or we want to have a lighter interface to, to ideate. And it's effectively a canvas to do that. And what I mean is we're removing the layers panel, removing the properties panel and stripping down what you can do to a limited set of features, which means that you can just ideate and have those ideas coming up as opposed to what color does it need to be? What font does it need to be? Font size, um, component. Components are available in FigJam, but they're sort of a secondary action as opposed to let's just uh, pull up the pull up the pen and just start drawing on the canvas. It's a lot free, a lot more free. And yesterday I was uh, in charge of the Figma Twitter account for the day and I shared a Fig Jam file and people were drawing in there for hours, just drawing little doodles and illustrations. That's not something people would normally do inside of Figma. No. So what we're trying to do is ultimately close the gap or surround the gap, I suppose, of designers, developers, product managers, UX designers, to have a shared space where you can work collaboratively together, which is also very importantly interoperable with Figma itself. And what that means is that I can copy design elements between the two tools and have um, interactions between them. So I could, let's open up something. 
Let's go back to my files here and go and open something up. Like the new loader. It's great, isn't it? It's actually yeah. just a test at the moment. So really? um, we're seeing if it works. So if I copy this frame, what I should be able to do is just drop it in here. And then if I create a couple of copies here, you can go and edit a text in there. Well, yeah. So what that means is that you as a designer can be working over here in your design file and the copywriter can be working inside the FigJam file and you can be in sync. Then let's have to think about how maybe the UX designer or somebody who's maybe a product manager or product owner would start to think about user flows. I can select one of my elements, press Shift and C and start to connect these things together with different arrows, different weights of arrows, different uh, thicknesses on here. And then when I move that around, that follows it around. Mm -hmm. Then we can start to build our user flows or maybe it's a database diagram or something like that. Anything that's sort of ideation based whilst it's still being a very live Figma design. So what you could do, and I probably, I presume lots of teams will do this, is inside their Figma file, probably set up their user flows like this, turn these all into components and publish them as a library, and then pull them in as components in here. You could then use variants. You could then use auto layout on all of your designs, and it can get a lot smarter. So we do have variants in here. If I pull this list item to the canvas, I can switch between these different variants as components, whilst they're still flexible with that text. And then switch between them. So it can get pretty smart pretty quick if you collaborate between the design and the development, um, sorry, the design and the non-design non or looser design canvas to have these interactions built. Somebody has done a very nice illustration over here. That is beautiful. Keep it coming. Yeah, so Fig Jam is effectively a lighter, lighter experience for yeah. design or ideation. And people seem to love it already. Um, my, my perspective on this is that it doesn't need to be super heavy on features because the closer we take it to and a design editing tool, the further we get away from just a, an open space to have ideas. However, we can obviously build lots of features for it and make that more useful. So if anyone does have any feature ideas for it, I know it's very simple at the moment, but we're, we're more than happy to listen to those things. Yeah, basically, if you're adding uh, some design feature, design tool features, you're adding an extra layer, layer of complexity and uh, you're basically like decreasing down uh, what you're trying what you were trying to achieve you know? yes exactly oops i just opened the file again I'm trying to paste the url in here mm -hmm. all right let's get some more people in here and let's post it on here All right, next question, hit me. Okay. Let's hear if anyone else has some questions. Yeah, feel free to jump in everybody. So uh, while we're waiting for questions, so is is uh, this something, so at the moment the FigJam is integrated uh, into Figma and uh, is there some, some plan for for FigJam to be standalone or it will remain just as it is. So the the challenge at the moment is to work out how they can be closer together rather than further apart. And there's obvious benefits and negatives to both approaches. The further they get apart, the more dis, dis, um, disjointed the design process becomes. 
the closer they get together, the more people don't see the value. And that's our challenge, really. So we're trying to work out how we can have features that enables people to be very successful from an ideation perspective, but not infringe on the design process itself. And it is a challenge. Yeah, definitely. That's something, you know, uh, uh, So we have some people uh, also who have joined us. So if you just joined, uh, you can hop in into Figma community file, uh, actually not community file, to the FigJam file. Yes, indeed. Uh, and uh, you can play and see what, leave your comments, of course. What is this? That's a... Uh an existential question that has just been asked in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> this is, we're just hanging out inside this fig jam file at the moment. If you have joined, it'd be great to come and stamp your face in this little square over here. Come and let us know on the line over here where you where your expertise level is uh, with Figma, just so we can give you some tips and help you out. Yeah. And then there's two other squares over here to let me know what your favorite feature is and also one feature that you would like us to build. Make it one feature as well. You only get one shot. Yeah. So uh, maybe also we can uh, discuss more about uh, features that people would actually like to see. Yes. So basically, well, we have video interaction. I don't know who. Yeah, it would be great to hear more about that. Yeah. Uh, I'm presuming they mean videos in prototyping, but I don't know. Yeah. So at the moment, there is, uh, you can. Yeah, import GIF or GIF. Yeah. Uh, and you can use them as some sort of uh, pack for, for a video. Yeah, so we do that um, over here. I think I've got this prototype set up. Yeah, so if I play this one. I don't know who you should buy. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Okay, so in this one, I'm just gonna um, I'm just gonna quit Spotify because it seems like screen, screen sharing, zooming, figmaring, and Spotifying is probably tripping me up a little bit here. Mm -hmm. So this prototype uses an animation at the start, which you can see. I'm not doing anything with the mouse; I'm just sort of letting that run, and then within here. We have these animated GIFs that are playing. So that you don't need to do anything spe special for this. And the way, whenever people typically ask me about a video, I would ask why you think you need it and can it be replaced by a simple animated looping GIF instead? Just because we need to think about a bunch of different things. The, the heavier we make our prototypes, the longer they're going to take to load and harder to us to interact with. We need to think about does that video play natively? Does it play automatically? Does it take a frame of the device that you're using? Do you build a custom design for the video player? All these sorts of things start to bubble up as soon as we introduce just a simple thing as, can we have video? And what I would always advise people to do when they start to think about prototypes is if we're pushing things so close to development that they're basically a developed prototype, how can we introduce developers closer in the design process to make sure that they can build the actual prototype for us? And we use the Figma designs as an indication about what we would like to achieve, as opposed to a replacement of what the coded prototype should be. So animated GIFs, yeah, they're going to be one of your friends when you start to build prototypes. Yeah. So we cover Eraser tool, uh, more dynamic interactions. <clears throat> so this one, uh, Jakey has explained, you know. Uh, so we an interaction that is easier to create versus making a new frame for an interaction. Okay, so I'm um, maybe understanding what you mean. Um, what you can do in here is something like this. So make a new page and name that proto. So what I'm going to do is make a tab bar menu 
and, uh, and push the prototype interactions to lots of other frames. So if we have a couple of iPhones over here, let's just align those nicely. And then we are typically gonna have a tab menu on the bottom of all of these with interactions between the three screens. If I just drag a frame, I know these are 375 wide, so I can just make this 375. And let's just go for 120 high, make the menu black, rename that to menu, turn it into a component. I should probably turn my keyboard shortcuts on. And then add some simple icons in there just so we can add the interactions. So let's say we've got icon one. Let's just make that centered like so. Icon two and icon three. Whoops. And we will space these out by 40. This would probably be a bit more sophisticated when you're building out yours, but this is just an example. If I select this ellipse here and go to prototyping, I can pull up that interaction up here. And let's make that, let's just keep it instant for now. Second one up here, third one up here. So we have three, three navigation menus set up. If I then copy this and paste it into my frame and align it to the bottom and then paste it here, same and here, same, and then click on the canvas, you can see that we have all of those prototype connections already set up for us. So this just saved me so much time by using a component outside of there that we, then we can scale up everything from there. So that's the first, I suppose, trick at scale that I would typically do for anything like an interaction that needs to be propagated down for loads of different frames. And then you can go and select all the connections and then change them all. So if I select uh, this, 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 and I wanted to change them, I could do that from over here. So now you want that to be smart animate. So they blend together, then it should propagate down to those individual frames. So that's going to be really useful when you start to think at scale in your designs as well. But then we can start to think about things like interactive components, which is currently in beta. And you can see that down the right hand side, we have interactive components beta here. I could have it baked into a variant as well. So we can make use of variants and interactive components to have our prototype connection set once in a library and then push out somewhere else. Doesn't necessarily work for the menu, but the interactions within the menu could be done. So if we look at this page here, we have some examples. I've got some switches that have set up. So you can see our variant component. And we have on this one, we have a while pressing change to this one. And then when your mouse goes up, it changes over here. So we've got a couple of nice interactions on these switches. The buttons we have whilst hovering change to this button and then while pressing, we do this one. So it's more like a native interaction where you press down on something and you can have a hover and press down. This one I think is just to hover here. Yeah, so if you hover on it, it changes to this frame. That could be a drag, it could be something else. And then this one over here is actually a delay. So this would actually give us a nice animated loop of a loader. And to preview that, I'm just gonna drag a copy of these into this frame here. Just so we can see. Oops, don't want to resize it. And then I can go and play this. So you can see that Lodo is already spinning around without me having to do anything. So you can just build that so much quicker than you'd have to with every single file that you're using. The switch, I can toggle that on or off, button hovering and pressing and the switch is over here. Then we have that hover interaction on there as well. And what I can then do is go and publish this as a library. So I can set up my switches in my design library file, design system file, whatever you want to call it, UI kit, and then publish it to my team. They could then use that in their designs in any file and these interactions would persist. So again, there's another little thing that would save you so much time because traditionally what you'd have to do is create this every single file. And this, this when it's in public uh, usage, will save you a lot more time. No problem, Jackie. Great. 
So the the last question was like uh, variable fonts, which are not exactly exactly parts right now. <laughs> yeah. So I'll just give you some context. We do have people working on that internally. I don't have a live date for when that will be shipped, but we people are very in, we have a vested interest in making fonts as best as we can. We've had a couple of customers complain that they can't use them, so it's very important for us to be able to support that. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's really great a great feature and uh, it will uh, like uh, be so much easier you know to work uh, with typography and uh, since uh, we're on typography is there uh, anything uh, that is or is there anyone maybe who's working on uh, some redesigning of uh, typography drop down tool or <laughs> I mean to preview. Uh, yeah <laughs> yeah so that's another one that comes up all the time and it's the same team that work traditionally on the editor so people who are, who are working on a more sophisticated type management mm -hmm. includes both of those things great because we know that it can be quite frustrating particularly for people who i suppose are more graphic in their design nature who do need to preview fonts i personally don't need to preview fonts mo mo a lot of the time because i'm just using a subset I would only ever use two or like two or three fonts in any design work that I'm doing as part of a business. And I would know what they look like. Whereas if you're doing things like graphic design work or something a bit looser, I appreciate that it would be a lot easier to be able to do that. There is a plugin. Um, if I just search font, see if I can find it. Maybe this one. It allows you to preview. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. yeah, so I'll just pop this in the chat as well in case anyone else. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's handy, but obviously it's not. Was, yeah, I was just thinking like in some terms of, you know, uh, maybe uh, categorization of of uh, serifs, uh, monospace fonts, you know, right. uh, filtering and all. Uh, preview, of, as you said, you know, uh, to me is also not so much, you know, something that I need, but uh, some something that I can filter by yeah. uh, would be really. Uh, That's a really nice idea. Yeah. Like how you do it in uh, Google fonts. Yeah, yeah. Well, that'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, you. so someone just landed a nice, amazing down here. Let's just give that one a nice little thumbs up. Okay. Uh, so maybe we can also uh, right now switch to switch to uh, branching or versioning. I don't know how people know it in uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, which, which term is correct you know uh, i presume both branching yeah. is just your inter like internal probably term for or yeah it's um <laughs> depending on who you talk to <laughs> uh, what the word is i'm just going to create a file in here and we're going to put some stuff in it so i'm going to say branch with my file name add in a frame in there and let's say we have a button with nothing inside and then in my branch i want to make some changes so the fundamental difference in workflow is going to change when branches get introduced if people aren't familiar with what a branch is it's effectively a way to have a a version of a file that you can edit that is non-destructive to the main file. So I can have my file over here and I can work very nicely over here if I want to with my team. If I want to work on something specific or a different version of something, maybe it is this button that we're looking at, I can create a branch of this file. I can work in there. And then when I'm satisfied that that is ready, I can merge that into the main file and then everybody can work again together. We can have as many different branches of different features as we want to make, to make iterations on our designs a lot easier and a lot more effective because we're effect we're basically aligning to what a, uh, a development team's workflow would be a developer never works on the main file and on the the main code base they would always work inside a branch yeah and it just makes things a lot easier to manage and maintain and you, you always know that if you make a mistake then you're not going to be in trouble <laughs> because it's just in your branch and you can remove that branch if you need to so just give you some context about what it means in, in a broader scheme. Within Figma, we are giving you the optional 
chance to make a branch or not if you want to, if you're on an organization plan, very important. You don't have to use it if, if your team doesn't want it. That's, and that's a, a bonus so that I've, over a, another tool that I don't, I'm not going to mention in that you, you have to use it. So if you don't want to use it, you can still rely on version history to manage your files. And version history is accessible from the top menu here. And you can see because it's a brand new because it's a brand new file, there's only this current version in there. If I go and show you a, another version, another file, we can see a better example. I've just seen our good friend Rusmir arrive. So if I open up this file, excellent question, Pierre. So if I open this file and I go to my version history, you can also see we have six branches up there. If I go to this version history now, you can see we have Roger is in here. We have other colleagues in there, Katie Jane's in there, all making changes to these files. We have auto saves from back in time. And I can click any of those to roll back to see what's going on in that, in that instance. If I wanted to share this link, this version with somebody, I could right click, I could copy that link and I could send it to you. You could see that slice of the file and I can continue to work live without disrupting what you're seeing. And this one's really useful for developer handoff. Branching takes this concept to another level in that I can share a file with somebody. If I go back and look at this version, for example, click that, you can see it's loading up at the top. There's different, there's different pages in here. There's, although this file, the design hasn't changed very much. I can still see lots of different things going on, but I can't make any edits. All I can do is view it. And that's why branching is a bit more of an advanced level to this version history. So I just to escape that. I just press escape on my keyboard. That brings me back to the live version of the file. Inside my original file now, our branch file. If I drop down the menu, you can see we've got this create branch label. And let's just call this um, meetup branch. Create that in here. That then opens up a new file. So I still have my main branch file here. The icon in the middle says this is a branch and the name of the branch is meetup branch. I can view the main file from here. So if I commanding, well, I'll just click that. <laughs> it takes me back to that main file. And then I can see we now have this one branch. And what I'm gonna do is go back to the files here just so we can open them up together. And inside that file thumbnail now, you can see we have a dropdown that says main and meetup branch. So let's open up that in a new tab. So over here I have the main file and over here I'm going to open up the branch. And I'm also in that file twice, which is quite interesting. So now let's open up that branch. I can open it up here. I can copy the link to send to somebody if they want to view just that branch or I can rename it. In here you can see well, there's only one branch on this file, but this would be all of my branches. And if people merge or delete branches, they would be up here in this archive feature here. I just interrupt you for a second. Yeah. So uh, since you're talking about copying uh, the link for pre preview, so does that mean that uh, actually in the future we will be able to copy the link and, for example, send it to client uh, on some branch, uh, and while we're still working uh, in the original file, uh, and uh, we have some major changes, you know, and we don't want them to see, you know, uh, something that's that's uh, in the yeah. problems. Yeah, so if I open this branch and make a change in here, make it red, and go back to the main file, that's not affected. So you can still be working in here or not. You could be working in your own branch, and I can be working in here and share that with my client from up here. They can come in and review that work, see if it's a, see if they can approve it or not, add their comments like you would expect in any regular Figma file and have that isolated handoff process. The two main benefits I see for branches are things like handoff or collaboration with external stakeholders or internal stakeholders even, or for design systems. So if we think about our components, let's take a look at this. So that, in traditional library file, we'd have our buttons, et cetera. And I would create a branch in my buttons file to maybe make my new button like this. Maybe this one is like this. 
inside the branch. We could test it. I could pull up some frames. I could use it in context to see how it feels with the design, et cetera, et cetera, get that signed off internally. And then when I'm ready, I can go and merge that work into the main file. If I make changes in that main file, you can see at the top menu here, we have update from main file. So I can inherit changes as well. If I'm working on a branch and then you add something in the main file, I could pull that into my branch and then continue to work as well. Similarly, inside the, the, the branch file, because it is just a regular file, I can still see the version history. I can still export from here. I can duplicate as a new file in, in indiv individually if I want to. But let's just go and review and merge these changes. So what's going to pop up now is that we have all these new stuff that I've added to this file, which is probably not what I would normally do, but just to show you what would typically happen. If we look at this list now, we have added, 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 edited. So I know there's a change that's happened here and you can see the side-by-side -side view of those changes. So that original gray button that we have in the main file here is now red. I could view that side-by-side -side, or I can add an overlay on here and just see these like this dragging the opacity. This opacity is not great in this example, but you can imagine if you have maybe a card component with heading, subtitle, image, link, and you remove the link from the second one, you'd be able to drag that opacity to see the differences between those components in there. If I go back to my frame now and see all the changes, this is great, I'm happy. I can merge that. It then closes that file and returns me to the main branch file with all this new stuff included as well. If I drop down the menu and go to see all branches again, there's no active branches because I merged it. No branches in my yours tab because that's also been merged and closed. However, we do have our branch in the archived tab and it's got the label of merged in there. So I know that it's still there, it still exists. I can still send people a link to it, but as it's not active anymore. So you cannot continue like in, in regular Git so you cannot continue your branch uh, uh, after you merge it. So if I, I can still open it, yeah. let's see what happens when I open it. And it says archived at the top here. I could duplicate as a main file or create a new branch, main, basically because we've now merged it back. It's not as advanced as Git. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if it will be. I don't know if it needs to be. Yeah. So yeah. People have definitely asked whether you can have branches of branches, which <laughs> is potentially very complex. I think that the issue that we see is most designers are never introduced to this as a concept. And if we make it as simple as possible, it, it's not going to make people confused and be scared to use it. This is very much a version one. It's obviously going to get more complex as we try to improve the functionality. But at the same time, we want to make it as easy as possible to create, consume, share, and merge. We have a question, yeah. Yeah, Pierre has just asked quite a similar question to you in the, the tree structure. I don't see why not. Um, what we don't necessarily want to do is make designing an admin experience. And if we think about all the, the extra sort of surrounding the design process, those things we could introduce, it might make designing less fun. And we don't necessarily want that, but still at the same time, we do want accountability. So there's that balance there of what should we show? How much should we show to make sure you can do your job and that your manager is satisfied with what you're doing? Yeah. And basically, you, uh, Pierre, there is some sort of uh, basic uh, tree uh, structure you, you showed us in the demo example. Yeah. Uh, you, you see the, when someone merged something and who merged it and the name of that branch. So uh, it is some sort of Git tree. Yeah, and in, in essence, you got the drop down of the, all the branches, but it's not necessarily a tree of those and the, and the timestamps and that sort of thing. So you can you, you kind of kind of see it, just not in the same way you'd see it in a terminal. Yeah, but you had it in, in this file on the right side. Yeah, uh, the, the whole. Yeah, uh, so in the version history of the history, file, Yeah. Yeah. So if I jumped up to the version history here, you can see I've got that history of everything that's happened. We've got like auto saves and branches. Yeah, so just on that note of comparing and, and merging, anybody who is an editor on that file could create a branch and merge that back in. So there just needs to be 
some process internally to determine if that happens and who is responsible for making those mergers. Because as you can imagine, anybody, if you're all creating work out of this file and you all merge it in, that might cause problems. So there, there is uh, no like pull request? Not right now. <laughs> yeah, okay. So it's, it's, it's process really, but it's, it's very similar to how anybody can currently publish a library if you're in that file. I just recommend not doing it <laughs> and making sure that people are aligned to a certain time stamp when like, libraries are released on this day and then that happens. Same with branches. Yeah, so so question for libraries. Uh, you, you showed us that you can uh, create in if you create an, uh, a new branch and then you uh, create uh, some new elements, some new components. Yeah. Uh, if, for example, if you are branching the uh, library yeah. file and you create new set of libraries, so until they are merged into the main file, uh, they are not in library, in components library. Yeah. Exactly. So if I open up this branch here, we can see Anthony is doing something in there, but maybe I'll create one, my own branch. Button. Button v3. Again, it opens up as a new file. Mm -hmm. And I can go and make my changes. Let's just reset this border radius, maybe add a stroke. Nice button. Dropping down the menu here, there's no publish. Mm -hmm. So I need to review and merge that change first before I wanted to publish that to my team. So there's, as a, the typical workflow for large design organizations at the moment is they'd have separate files for their design versions. They may still want to do that because you can publish individual files as opposed to not being able to publish a branch. And that's the balance that we probably need to, to strike. Yeah. Yeah, but this makes sense, you know, for, for especially for, for libraries and for uh, reviewing and uh, pushing uh towards the, the the whole organization yeah and just i think being able to invite clients to different versions of the same file is going to be really powerful yeah yeah that's definitely true okay great great feature uh so uh any dates for non-organization uh i think someone asked or um i don't think it will be i think that just to give you some sort of context on where we see those plans the pro plan is definitely designed for freelancers. And the reason I say that is because from a security perspective, anybody on that design team could change the main email address to their personal email address and steal all of that work. And not that I want to make anybody scared here, but I think that's just sort of the reality of the difference between an organization and a pro. Mm -hmm. um, and with that in mind, we sort of, compound those ideas to, to the point where if you're a design systems team, and that's probably the most likely use case for something like that, you're probably actually going to have a design systems team inside your Figma organization. And that's where all those components and everything live. And then you have this layer on top of the branching. So it, although it's probably quite annoying for lots of people who don't have organization, it theoretically, it makes a lot more sense to have them localized to specific use cases like a design system or something like that, as opposed to being available on every single plan. True. That's not stopping you from using version history very effectively, though, and yeah. different file copies for different versions of components. Okay, yeah, that's true. So, uh, so the branching is something that was released uh, on config this year and announced. Uh, so some other things were also announced. One of them was new mobile application. Yes. So uh, it's in beta, beta, so you can maybe. Yeah, um, I would show you it, but I actually use my phone as my webcam, so I can't now <laughs> go and show you. Um, I have it installed and it's a hundred times better experience than the Figma Mirror app at the moment. And it's going to replace that and make you a lot happier when you're doing things like testing with clients or getting feedback on designs, because it's not just a, like a Figma URL anymore. It's like the native experience on your device. 
And so there's a, there's a bunch of cool things you can do. You can preview the prototypes using the interactions of the, the prototype you built, but also feeling a lot more native in the device you're supporting or the device you're using. You can share it to people and they're open in their device without them having to be on your Wi-Fi network, which is very handy, as you can imagine. You can do that with anybody who, oh, we have a question, I think. Oh, we'll come back to that. So you can, yeah, so share it with your team, share it with clients, and they can open it natively inside that, inside the app. What's also really cool is that at, at Figma, we use Figma for presentations too. So we would navigate through a presentation like a prototype. And you could use your mobile app as effectively a speaker navigator. So you can navigate between your slides using your device, which can be another really nice use case that some, somebody may not have considered doing before. But if you're sitting there in, like you're doing a, a speaker presentation, maybe like this, and I had a presentation slides and I had that open on my phone, I could just tap next or previous on the slides as the prototype to go between the Figma slides behind me in the, in the wow. slides. Another really nice use case that it was like a, a, a side benefit to something that was originally supposed to be just better prototyping. Yeah, uh, I just uh, downloaded a few, I don't know, weeks ago. Or when, when, I don't know, when was it released yeah. uh, in public? And uh, I played a few days ago with it and it's really, it's uh, intuitive, it's easy to use, uh, it's fluid, it's really fast. Uh, yeah. The performance is really, um, I would dare to say better than than prototyping maybe in desktop. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, the <laughs> interactions in uh, in in milliseconds are animations actually are one on one. So there's no lag. Everything is uh, on time, and uh, it's really uh, I recommend everyone you know to go and download. Uh, yeah, it, it would just make it a lot easier to test your test your ideas. Um, yeah. And as you can imagine, that will also be work coming out on iPad as well. So any sort of cross device testing you need to do should be supported. Yeah. So uh, is there any uh, plan for, for uh, FigJam and uh, iPad uh, <laughs> collaboration? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, yes, there is. It's a big, big feature request, as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, and we want to support that as fast as possible. So we do have people working on that yet. Yeah. Great, great. Yeah. I think that when that happens, you'll see a lot more illustrations and a lot more doodles. And I can't wait to see what people are going to be doing on that. Yeah, it will be boom. <laughs> yeah, it'll be it'll be great. It'll take you to the next level, really. No. Yeah, yeah. For collaboration, um, and even thinking about going back to an office and doing sort of ideation sessions together on devices, it'll be a lot more fun. Uh, so we mentioned the. the... Uh, some sort of uh, handoff between uh, developers and designers. And uh, so basically, how do you deal with that inside of your organization, inside of Figma? And uh, what's the, like, the biggest struggle maybe uh, at this point, you know, for handing over or what are the largest gaps that you're maybe not covering at the moment, but you wish in the future or you wish you could? Yeah. So just to give you a quick run through of how that works if you look at the top here i'm in a view only file the same file we we're just looking at and i can come and see everything so i can look through the pages i can see individual components i can see styles if you're used to something like a zeppelin or something like that i can see the spacing between elements so i can get all the stuff that i need as a developer to see how that designer has set that up what's sort of the next stage of that is when we start to use components we could we should and probably what we can and probably should be using component descriptions to make it a lot easier to get that information out of the file. When I select this component here, you can see on the right-hand side, we've got that inspect tab open. And my designer has added this really nice, useful documentation for me over here. And it's also linking out to documentation that lives inside a Figma file. Mm -hmm. So I can click that and it would link me to a Figma file and I can see more information about that component. And within here, I can also see my variant properties. So if you're building a front end in React or Angular or something, I can paste that in and it works just straight off the bat. And then things like brand guidelines, all that sort of stuff gets pulled in as well. The thing that I think we could be doing better is to allow you to export directly to code. <laughs> and that would be fantastic. And one day we'll get there. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see how we, can, how, how we can get close to that. But at the moment, we see design teams across the world be very successful with this plus documentation. Documentation is super important to make sure you have the context 
as a developer, as a product manager, as a copywriter to ensure that the designs get built as you intended. Yeah, something I noticed uh, for uh, 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 people who work in our organization is that when we get uh, like a view only file, uh, which which someone needs to in, in implement and you know to develop. Uh, sometimes because you know you have all sort of pages, uh, somewhere are components, somewhere yeah. are, uh, all sort of typography, and uh, they don't have an uh, overview of the whole uh, maybe of typography, yeah. the whole uh, naming of the whole of every button, you know. So that's something uh, maybe <laughs> in the future uh, is something to look look out for. Uh, for example, today we had you know a few few typography choices, you know, uh, and people they don't download it; they pull it from Google Fonts or the Type Kit or Adobe Fonts or how is it called today, and you know they just want to know which fonts are there. You know they have to inspect everything uh, one by one. To see, you know, maybe what's going on there and which font yeah. is, yeah. So, like something like overview of maybe components of or fonts or or styles is really something uh, would be something nice. Also. Yeah. So you can you can see that I suppose as a designer when you're in the file, but not as a developer. Um, so if I just click anywhere on the canvas, I can see yeah all of those styles here, but the developer can't see that. So it's, it's a really nice suggestion actually to get that context. Yeah. Yeah. I just realized we are at time. Yeah, that's a weird one hour. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, yeah, Thanks everybody, for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Louis, uh, for joining us, and uh, it was really a pleasure, you know, to to talk with someone uh, which who is so close uh, to what we're using every day, yeah. and uh, you're really building a nice pro product, and it's uh, nice to see, you know, that uh, you don't ship it uh, uh, like million features at the moment but you're trying to test it you're trying to include the community and uh, people uh, all around the world so that's really something nice uh, you, yeah thank you it would be great actually if people didn't mind if people came on their camera so we could take a photo together and um, you don't have to if you don't want to but that would be great if we could do that so if you have camera turn it on <laughs> No, they're shy. Give 30 seconds to, for people to join in. Here we go. Here's Elliot. Here he is. Maybe just five more seconds, 10 seconds, see if anybody else wants to join in. No? Nobody will? Here we go. All right. Should we take a photo? All right. Three, two, one. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. See you next time.